What's up, you guys? Welcome to today's video. So as you can tell by the title, we're gonna be talking about what I experienced when I was released from prison. I actually had to go to a halfway house and I had to live with five other women. So we're gonna spill all the tea when it comes to that, but I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the obstacles and the challenges and everything that I faced while I was getting out of prison and living in a halfway house. Before I get started, today's video is sponsored by WeTV. They're coming out with another season of Life After Lockup. And if you are not watching that show, I don't know what you're doing with your life. If you love the content I put out, then you will be obsessed with Life After Lockup. This really shows people leaving prison and struggling with all of the things I talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, parole, the restrictions around parole, temptations with drug and alcohol, families, and all the good stuff too, like having babies and getting married and all all of the things that we go through when we get out of prison, both positive and negative. And I relate so much to the show because I've been there and I've gone through so many things that these people are going through. And what better way to understand what a person goes through when they get out of prison than to watch it, right? So. If you wanna watch that show, you can subscribe to their YouTube channel. That is linked down below. You can also watch them on WeTV Friday nights at 9, 8 p.m. Central. And I am dying to hear who you guys love the most. So let me know in the comment section down below who your favorite characters are, who you're rooting for, and what you think is gonna happen on the new season of Life After Lockup. I think it's so important to support people coming out of prison and to learn about their journey because I think that there's a strong disconnect with society. I don't think a lot of people understand how difficult it is to get out of prison and that's why the show is so amazing and so heartfelt and so real and I just can't even say enough good things about it. So set your DVR, watch it on YouTube, and if you're really curious about everything I talk about on this channel, you're gonna love the show. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So when I was released from prison, I had to go to a halfway house. I was in Arkansas, that's 1300 miles away from my friends and family. Well, I had friends, but they were either deported or they were still in prison. And I had to do it the right way this time. I couldn't just get out and do the same old thing because my daughter was born in prison. So the stakes were really high for me. And I went to a place called Oxford House. Now this technically is like a three quarters house, meaning staff don't live there. There's no like locks on the doors or buzzers, but you do have rules. And the rules that I had were curfew, I was required to go to meetings and I was required to pay rent. That's fair. However, I didn't have a job. So the rent was $100 a week and that started immediately. There was no grace period. It took me two weeks to find a job. That's $200. It took me another week to get a paycheck and that paycheck was only for one day. So three weeks and I got $60. So now I'm $300 behind on my rent. By the time I got a paycheck, I was $500 behind on my rent before I could actually pay rent and I was always behind. Now, when I first got out of prison, like a lot of people go through, I didn't have anything. I had a very worn out Bible that was falling apart. I actually still have it. That's what I had. And I had prison sweatpants. I had my number down the side. I didn't even have sneakers because I couldn't afford to buy them when I was in prison. Side note, yes, you can buy sneakers in prison. Highly recommend it because spending your whole life in those flat Bob Barker shoes, they hurt your feet and they're not good for your feet. And yeah, so highly recommend if you're serving any time in prison to get actual sneakers because the difference, night and day, and my feet really hurt all the time. So motivation to not break the law, right? I didn't have sneakers, I had shower shoes. So I, I was at this halfway house and the time that I arrived at this halfway house, the chapter or uh, the person that was over this halfway house had kicked everyone out because they relapsed and she kind of came in and took over and she made me like be in charge. So the way that this Oxford house would work is it was a democracy. So we voted people in and we all held each other accountable and all of that. So imagine you just get out of prison and you go to this halfway house and this lady tells you, I kicked everyone out because they didn't follow the rules. It's just you and one other girl, I'm sorry. So it was me and one other girl who had paid rent. That's the only reason she was able to stay is because she was paying her rent on time. The rent would go into a bank account that was for the halfway house and then it was up to us to pay all the bills. So there is a treasurer, there is a secretary, there is a president and all of that within this Oxford house. That's like the structure of it or whatever. And it was a democracy. So we voted people in or voted people out, you know, like you are the weakest link. Good 
goodbye. Not like that, I'm just kidding. But every night we had meetings and we would go to NA or AA meetings together. That was a requirement of living in the house as well as paying rent and respecting everyone. And there was house rules and all of that, right? So when I first got there, it was just me and one other girl. And I had to borrow her shoes to go to my telemarketing job that she helped me get. And I was really embarrassed of that because I was dead broke and I had no money. So I voted voted another girl into the halfway house and she became my roommate. So the way that this house was set up is there was two twin beds in my room, two twin beds in the other girl that was living there before me. So she had a roommate and then there was one bedroom that was just big enough for one. And then there was a separate room downstairs that was big enough for three. So you could fit a lot of people in there, right? I voted my roommate in. I went to a rehab and we kind of met with some women and I voted this other woman in. She became my roommate and we all worked at the same job because they hired felons. This was the hardest time of my life because I didn't know what was gonna happen. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to get custody of my daughter. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to stay sober and I sure as hell didn't even know if I was going to be able to eat that day. The other women in the house did have government assistance, but because I had drug charges, the state of Arkansas wouldn't help me with anything, would not help me with food stamps, for example. And trust and believe, I was starving because I couldn't afford to pay for rent and get a couple of clothing items so I don't look, you know, homeless at my job. So I relied on Plato's Closet and ramen noodles even when I was out of prison. So I was two months out of prison still eating ramen noodles because I couldn't afford anything else. The cool thing is the other women would cook a lot and they were really good cooks. One in particular, she taught me how to make the best green beans ever, bacon fat. <laughs> So they would cook and they were super nice and I was able to eat their food, but you're not supposed to, you know, and I never wanted to be like, oh, can I get some of your food? Like I never wanted to do that, but they were always really nice and really kind because they understood kind of what I was going through, right? During this time, I had a laundry list of things that I was supposed to do. I had to get my own apartment because CPS decided I could not have my daughter at this halfway house, even though it was okay for the halfway house within their rules and guidelines if I had my own room with my daughter there. CPS said no. So now I have to find a place that rents to me. And this is like just, it steam rolls, right? I, had, I faced so many obstacles during that first year. So I went to apartment after apartment after apartment after apartment, paid $25 per application fee to get denied because I was a felon. So no one wanted to rent to me. And during that time, my depression was so severe. And like I said, the laundry list of things that CPS wanted me to do was so high. I have talked about that on my channel before. It did take me a long time to finally find an apartment and somebody that was willing to rent to me. It took me six months of working two minimum wage jobs to get one decent paying job as a freight broker for a transportation company called Landstar, which I was so blessed to have, but it took months. And that first year was probably one of the hardest years of my entire life. Aside from having my daughter in prison, it was very, very difficult and my depression was at an all-time high. I was living with women that were also struggling with substance abuse disorder. The woman that was the chair or the, the chapter leader or the person, she was a recovering alcoholic. She was supposed to be in charge and then I was like the president and I was supposed to make sure everyone was doing what they're doing, which I'm, t I'm too cool for that. So if you're a little late, I'm not gonna like rat you out or anything, you know what I mean? Just, just whatever, it's fine. So I was really bad at that because I don't wanna tell everyone like, oh, you're two minutes late, Stacy. Like, no, life is hard enough. So I was super bad at that and I think the chair leader, I forget what they actually called her, chapter chair? Chapter, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I forget what they called her, but the person that was in charge of this, she got onto me a lot. Cause she's like, are you checking meeting sheets? Are, are these people coming in on time? And I'm like, yeah, they're fine they're on time, they're going to all the meetings that they said, if they're not at work, like yes, they're going to work. I lied because I didn't want anyone to get in trouble because life's hard enough, especially for people that struggle with substance abuse disorder. So she kind of got crappy because she realized that I was covering for them, but like, not like a regular mom, I'm a cool mom. <laughs> I don't know. It's not my job. I'm not responsible for you. I'm responsible for me. And I didn't really know that I was going to have to be that person. And I'm crap at that. I'd make the world's worst parole officer. You know what I mean? Because I'd be like, oh, just don't do it again. It's fine. And then I would don't do it again. It's fine. People to death. And it would just not be a good situation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wor I'd be the worst. So I'm not trying to rat you out, man. No. Ho horrible. Don't put me in charge of anything. Don't do that. It's bad. Nothing will get done. <laughs> Anyway, the chapter lady, she became a little clicky with the other 
girls in the house and I'm so severely introverted that like I would work and then I would just come in and I would be really, really tired because I was working two jobs. And one day I came in, I had a little bit of groceries and I was kind of excited that I actually could buy some groceries, but I didn't buy like extravagant stuff. You know, I bought like stuff to make sandwiches, a couple Tostitos pizzas and like just really cheap crappy food and coffee. And I come in with groceries and the chapter chair was already kind of like annoyed with me because I wasn't like reprimanding the other women in the house for like not being late or whatever. Like I didn't know that was going to be my job and you're not paying me, so sorry. <laughs> so she she sees me come in with groceries and she's like, aren't you behind on your rent? And I was like, what? Yeah, but I have to eat, like I don't get, I don't get help with any, I have to eat, what are you talking about? So I was just kind of shocked that she was like questioning how I was spending my money when I was literally doing everything that I possibly could just to pay a little bit of rent, I was behind, but also pay for food and I had to pay parole fees and I was trying to go visit my daughter so I had to hustle rides, I didn't even own a car at that time, my daughter was placed four hours away, I could only see her for two hours and then I have to come back four hours, it was a nightmare and I was so tired from working two jobs and trying to do all these other things like counseling and meetings and go to see my daughter, go to parole, pay my parole fees, pay my fines, and I was barely making it. I mean, if I had $20 to make it through the week, that was, I was killing it. I had to overdraft gas, I don't even know how many times, right, just to make it. So she started to become like clicky with the other girls and I realized that I was never gonna get caught up on my rent and do what I have to do to get my daughter. So I started hiding my money you know, and not letting her know how much money I was making. And that sucked because I don't want to be that person. I don't want to have to lie to you and let and tell you that I'm never going to pay you the $500 that I'm behind because I have to get an apartment, right? During that time in the halfway house, there was like a dark cloud following me around and it was so heavy and there was so much pressure on me at all times from parole, from CPS, from the halfway house, from these jobs that I didn't even have a car to get to. So every day was a hustle. Every day was a struggle just to get to work, just to get back. And it was so challenging. So eventually I started to talk about moving out and finding an apartment and I was asking the other women if they knew of places that would hire felons and I was becoming really frustrated. The chapter chair didn't like my attitude. Every time she would ask me like, was this person late? Was I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. I, I wasn't watching, you know, because I wasn't. Because I was probably crying in the bathroom because I'm stressed the F out, right? So I don't know what Lucy did because I'm trying to I'm trying to eat a sandwich and go to sleep so that I can work my two jobs tomorrow. Well, she said, if anyone in this house is going to relapse, it's going to be you. You're not even taking this seriously. And I'm like, "Oh my god. Okay. Um, I'm on the edge, lady." <laughs> you know, like I didn't need that criticism too. But I just said, "We'll see." Because that's my argument with a lot of things. You know, if you tell me I'm going to relapse, if you tell me I'm going to fail, we'll see. If you don't think I'll win, bet against me, right? So I didn't have this confidence that I have today. I didn't have that back then. But a lot of people at that time put me down and told me that I would fail. So one day I get a phone call from someone that had just gotten out of prison and they said, Jess, I need you to come with me to go sell a few O's, a few ounces. I'll pay you X amount of dollars. I think it was like $200. Just, ri just ride with me, just be there with me. And I'm like, okay, let me call you right back, you guys. I paced around this halfway house and I'm like $200, I need $200. You know, like it's not a lot of money, but when you have no money, $200 is gonna help, right? So I'm trying to justify this and I'm like, it's 200 bucks, just ride with her for a couple of hours, $200, like you need that money, you could put that away, like you need it, right? I was so afraid that I was gonna call her back and say yes because I need the money and money was always my biggest temptation and I need money now because I am freaking, I am hungry, I am broke, I don't have a car, I don't have an apartment, my kids in CPS, like I need money. Like this is not a game, you know? And I was super, super, super stressed out. So I went to call her back and I hung up the phone and I told all the women, let's go to a meeting. And the chapter chair looks at me like, What's up with her? Because I was never the person that's like, let's go to a meeting. I was like, let me try to get a few more hours of work because I need the money, right? I was never like, let's go to a meeting. No, a meeting is gonna cost me money because I have to go to my job. Like, I need as many hours as I possibly can. And I don't attribute my, my sobriety to a 12-step meeting only because I was sober in prison and 
that's a video for another time, but I didn't work the steps. And to me in that moment, right then and there, I need as many hours as I can get. So when I'm like, let's go to a meeting, everyone's like, what? And I went to a meeting that night because I knew that I would be safe there, which I just want to say thank you to those meetings because if I didn't have a meeting to go to, who knows where I would be right now. But I was so grateful for that. And eventually I moved out and I was able to find a duplex and life was still hard. I was barely making ends meet. I had no savings. Slowly but surely I was able to find a better job, find a toaster box car, a little Scion XB, which was the best car in the world because it was the first car that I bought with no drug money, best car ever. And it was a very slow process. That first year had so many obstacles and so many challenges that I barely made it. And that's what I would say to anybody getting out of prison. That first year is gonna challenge you and test you and try you. There's gonna be a million different obstacles. You're gonna be stressed out. People are gonna tell you that you are not gonna make it. People are just gonna be waiting for you to fail and go back to prison because recidivism rates are sky high. But let me tell you right now, there is no reason why you can't be successful out of prison because I did it. Maybe not the first time, but I figured it out and I realized if I just keep my life simple and my circle tiny, I can do this. Go to work and go home, go to work and go home. And while that is very boring and you feel like you're not making progress, I promise you, you are. Cause every day outside of that gate is another win for you. And there is no video that I could ever make that will articulate how you feel when you first get out of prison or how you feel trying to get your life back on track. That's why I highly recommend Life After Lockup so that you can see what these people go through. It's very important in breaking down the stigma of prison addiction and mental health to actually see people that like me are successful outside of prison or see the people leave prison and actually get to know them and, and understand their struggle from their perspective. So. I hope this video wasn't too rambly. I hope it all made sense. If you guys have any more questions on my experience living in a halfway house, please let me know in the comment section down below. I'll do a whole Q&A on it if you want me to. I'm gonna end today's video here. As always, I love you guys. Stay safe, stay sober, whatever that looks like to you because there's no wrong way to recover. Watch Life After Lockup on WeTV at 9, 8 central and I will see you in my next one. Bye, you guys.